Okay, welcome back to our second lecture for the day. Um, the last um, one now we've been looking at how we can walk into our uh, to journey into our emotional wholeness, and we were we were looking at uh, truths, and we covered the first truth of receiving the Father's love. I have attached the uh, the resource for uh, the two books that you can for your personal reading and studying. Uh, that, that you can use. It's there on the chat, The Father's Love, the book uh, that is available, as well as our identity in Christ, um, who we are in Christ is, is another uh, book. I shall post the same even for the e-learning students for a further reading so that uh, you, know, you can just be blessed and uh, stay a little more on the topic and on the truth and really experience uh, this love of God. Uh, is there any... Uh, question that Western or observation that any of you have and uh, uh, you know we can spend a couple of one, a couple of minutes just to uh, consider that before we go forward any question any thoughts any testimony any observation for yeah opening it up Yes, Shay, please go ahead, Shay. Thank you, Pastor. So, uh, Pastor, my question is, how do you, um, I, I kind of know the answer, but I, I just wanted to get clarification and make a discussion out of it. How do you tell, um, talk to people who feel that God has favorites? Um, sometimes people use David as an example, some people use John the Beloved as an example. How do you now try to make them understand that it's not that God made them favorites, but it was them who responded to God? So, you know, how do you do that? How do you able to how do you make their minds um, go beyond the fact that God doesn't have any favorite? He loves us all. You know, it is now left for us how we respond that you know, the time is our experience of that love, you know, like, how do you go mm -hmm. ahead? Thank you, Ma. You answered the question. You, you've answered it. I think it's just uh, how we interact with people. You're right. Uh, scripture also says God has no favoritism. Uh, God loves each and every one the same. Uh, yet, like you did say, uh, the, the, the people that we spoke about, you know, especially who have been chosen and blessed by God, uh, Abraham, you know, we see that he believed uh, God. Um, and there are, there are things that he did in faith, just knowing who God is, just trusting who God is. And so also we see David um, just following after the, the heart of God in, in everything. So we, uh, I, I think the only way to help them see that is take them through these, um, these very examples that are written in the Bible. You know, often when we do character sketches of people in, in scripture, you, you begin to see the way um, uh, the life that they lived uh, in to honor God, to fall after God. And not that any of these men did not sin. In fact, all of them, you know, were in places of uh, uh, um, of 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 sin. They they were there were places where they really, you know, showed unholy character. But yet their heart was right in front of God. Their desire was for God. Their, they just wanted to pursue and know God. And uh, the more, and, and I think one of the ways of doing that is really helping people with tangible uh, examples, you know, even at um, um, uh, examples with, with regard to their own lives, people they have pursued, people they have, um, uh, they have, they have loved in turn, uh, are especially maybe those who have taken the, um, uh, you know, have been in places where, where has reciprocated that love. So you tend, especially like when you look at children, you know, you have, let's say, two, two children, very different in the way that they, they, that they respond. 
um, not that you love them more, but probably a relationship is much easier with one than it is with another because of the way that the other person reciprocates your love or stands in obedience to you or stands in openness to you. So the relationship is much more stronger than maybe the relationship with, with another. Now, does that mean the parent doesn't pursue the other one? Of course not. The parent does pursue. But when there isn't a reciprocation, the relationship is does not blossom or it does not grow. So I would say one is, of course, to show them scripture. But for them to really tangibly experience that is... Oh, I mean, uh, I think one of the biggest ways that I find is looking for examples to help them um, see such truths. That what you would do in the natural, and how much more is it, it can we can we extrapolate that to to with with God? So the more that an individual pursues God, you know, the more that we draw nigh to Him, right? He draws nigh to us. That's that's. Uh, uh, that's what that, that, that's what it says, you know. That there is a relationship there. We we need to uh, abide. When you abide with him, he abides with you, right? So it so you you when you seek his face, he will he will make himself known to you. So there is that place where we can't just be um, passive recipients of the love, but we need to be active in our relationship and that is the same with any earthly relationship you find that you have to be actively uh, involved in that relationship actively investing in the relationship if the relationship needs to grow if you sit on the wayside hoping that only it comes from the other side it it isn't so and and i think that's probably one way that can be done uh, but i'm leaving it open to the to the class also is there someone else who has any other thoughts or anything else as to how could you help others know that god has no favorites and uh, that he loves each one of us and it is up to us to um reach out to god thank you faster for your contribution thank you yeah thank you shay yeah, I think Anita also has sent, how can we, um, how can we tell that people are loved when they're facing war, having been raped and seen the worst in life, even the mentally re retarded or people with deformed bodies, okay? So I think one thing for us to have a real, understanding and uh, foundational knowledge of is that um, God is not the creator of wars, the creator of rape, the creator of uh, illnesses or deformity, none of that. It is not God's will, it is not God's desire, it's not what God institutes. He permits but he doesn't institute it. And when we know that all of this is a work of the enemy. We do not, um, uh, we do not um, blame, or, or, uh, or, or rather, I would say, we do not. Uh, when we, when we really know who God is, and that what He has in store for us, or what He would like us to walk into, uh, we would be very sure of the fact that all of this that we see in the world around all the evil that happens in the world and uh, you've just named a few but there are so much more that we that we have not named all of this comes from the prince of the world right that he he's operational here and he does everything for for man for god's creation to be blinded by his uh, for what he truly is so Helping, I think, first and foremost, for people to really have uh, a right knowledge of who God is. A lot of, um, I mean, you know, if, if you speak to a general population, maybe not um, even, even maybe believers, they see the presence of God in evil, but they don't see the presence of, of an enemy in evil. Right? You speak to an unbeliever, they will never tell you there is there, there is an enemy or there is Satan who is there who wants to create evil. No, for them, it's all God who does good and evil. Right? 
but we believe and God has shown us in his word that he is a God of goodness and he is the father of lights and he gives good gifts to his children. And all that we see in the world is as a part of the fall, as a part of this part of sin. So to, to, to bring them to the right knowledge and awareness and understanding of who God is, I think is the most important way we minister to people who are hurting, to people who are in significant pain, that God uh, has made a way out for us to come to a place of wholeness, even through these different kinds of uh, conditions that, that you've mentioned. God has, well, God has made a provision for us to come out into a place of physical, emotional, spiritual, mental wholeness. He has made a provision for us. And we take that authority to bring that. Okay, And we know that whatever God permits, is something that he's he's done out of his will as well. So to, to really determine that, and I think the important thing is to help people know the truth of who God is, not in the way that the world sees God, that God is the one who's brought about evil on us. God is a good God, and God wants things that are um, that are blessings for us. I hope I answered your question, Anita. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. So um, we'll move on if there aren't any questions. We're going to be looking at the second point where we're looking at uh, is being. Yes, Christopher, go ahead. You have a question. Uh, yes, Pastor. Um, I mean, I don't think this is actually a question, but I think it's sometimes something that I kind of uh, you know observe or uh, you know experience uh, um, in the way uh, we as human beings uh, you know respond to uh, too much of something. You know, um, so where um, you know God, we know that God has God is got. I mean, it's full of love and there's so much of it and, you know, and uh, we as human beings, because we are iner inherently uh, also, uh, you, know, um, you know, have, there is, uh, there is evil, there's also, you know, there's need to, to be, uh, uh, to enjoy some of the things of, of life and, you know, maybe some, you could call it the lust of life, the lust of life. Um, we can be, we, we we are able to you know, take and we recognize that that there's this love, but uh, how much of it that we actually receive, and how much of it that we are we are we are we uh, want to receive, um, given the fact that we want to also live in this live you know in this world, and uh, you know experience some of the some of the some of the good things of life. Um, I mean, it's just something that I. I uh, I feel that you know I, I uh, you know people experience, and um, it might also explain why uh, there many people are not able to you know receive it, you know, because it's too much of it, you know, um, mm -hmm. and we are too good to be true. I guess that's what you're saying. Yeah. So this is just 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 an observation, and uh, you know, yeah. I'm not yeah. sure what you know what why if there any insights that, that can 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 can, uh, can be taken from there and, uh, uh, you know, um, can Im maybe improve the situation, you yeah. know. So uh, um, I, I don't know if I will be correctly, not correctly, but, but wholly responding to that. But I think one of the things that we do see is, um, uh, you know, when we, where is it that we first experience love? We first, uh, as uh, in the natural, the first um, places that we experience love is in the home. And uh, it's in those early, early years where we understand about trust and love. And no one has to tell us that. It's just through different ways in which we are cared for, we are not cared for, we are, uh, uh, we are responded to, we are neglected. So look at life situations of people and you will be able to tell what they understand about love. Um, 
like let's look at a child who grows up in a single home where the mother probably pursues something else uh, maybe let's say a career or another relationship leaving the child in the care of <clears throat> either uh, probably grandparents or let's say an institute what does the child understand about this love so, so that becomes the formative experience of what love is and when such a person comes to begin to see the love of God it can be hugely overwhelming because there isn't there, there, there doesn't seem to be any match at all from a place to where they've been abandoned to a place where there is lavish love you know to come to that place um, I mean I'm, I'm just I'm just uh, uh, imagining as to how how that step would be it, it's such an overwhelming step to step from a nothing into something of a lot you know it's too much to be true but uh, it, it, it is uh, is it something that hasn't happened of course it's happened and that that's only with the power of the holy spirit that that is what it means when god pours out his love so if god pours out his love it's something that is to stay or something that a person will not just have a revelation of but has an experience of so in the natural yes it looks too good to be true and how can an individual grasp it and these are certain things i see as not explainable but it is only the work of the holy spirit it is only his work that actually begins to form in the heart of that individual to experience that love so i don't know if i responded well to that but uh, that's how maybe i see that okay all right. No, I, 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 uh, sorry, I, I don't mean to de debate, the, debate the point too much, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it's it's um, it's about um, also just you know, you know, taking it, you know, receiving it. Uh, receiving it. No, yeah. it's there. You can't. You know, you're not able to take it because it's so much. Of it, yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I, I, I see that. So that's why I said it has to be a supernatural work. It's not something that can be done in the natural. You know, even things like forgiveness, it's not something that is easily done in the natural. It needs a supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to uh, help us to experience that which we know in the natural is very difficult or just too overwhelming to do. So, yeah, all right. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, observation, Christopher. OK, we'll, we'll move ahead with uh, uh, with our second point and uh, the second point looks as at uh, how we are established in our identity in Christ and we see that I mean for those of us who've been following through um, uh, you know sermons from from the church we, we would see that this is an important uh, truth that keeps being taught over and over again and uh, why this is because you know it's it's such an important thing to really know what is our mark or our identity in Christ and who we are in Christ and what he has done for us and as a result uh, who we are right so uh, we, we, the 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 one sentence that we keep talking uh, says that who we are in Christ is who we really are when we know who we are in Christ or what we have become as a result of Christ's sacrifice for us. That's what really marks you as a person. That's what really marks your identity. So, so you know, in when when you accept the Lord, it says that you will become a new creation. Right? The minute that you accept the Lord, your spirit being has completely changed the identity of your spirit being is changed into a new creation although you know the part of your your, your physical body remains the same and even your soul that there, there are there are things that do, do not completely change your spirit begins to change and that is the very part of you that that talks about that identity so god desires that we live out of this this spirit change we live out of the spirit identity why because of the price that he paid for us to give us that identity and he paid a really huge price to bring us to a place of who we truly are and that was 
when when he took away our sins he also took away every part of us that has been depraved and has and has brought us back to the way that he saw us the original image that he created us to be so when we are established in our identity in christ what does it do it changes number one the way we relate to god we you know um often we have we we i mean i i remember this as you know being in in a in my own traditional church um this this thing of you being a sinner was often that was being thrown at you you know and so i remember um even after being saved uh, at a young age every uh, you know um uh, every conference or every camp or every vbs there was there was this it was it was not like a renewing of your um uh, of, of your commitment but it was more of you know yes you know come back and say that you're a sinner and and you've been guilty and all of that and you know you have to come back to that that point and stay there in that point but you know it was such an eye opener for me to understand that just by by um by what christ did for me and for the fact that i responded to that call has made me a redeemed person has made me outside so i'm no more a sinner for me i'm i'm a saved child of god no more a slave to sin but i'm a saved a uh, child of god so just it transforms the way that we relate to god and often you know we like like was my experience we often find people beating themselves up and saying you know i am a sinner and i am unworthy but but what has god god done i mean it like i said it took him uh, a huge price to bring you to a place of sinfulness to a place of salvation from a place of slavery to a place of victory from a place of being a slave to being a place a place to being a son or a daughter of god and that's the identity we have we we take away the identity of us being sinners but but we have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb so I, even as we we don't look at it with pride we look at it with humility knowing that who we were is no more who we are right now because of the transforming power of god so when we when we build ourselves in the identity of christ jesus it transforms or it changes the way that we look at god the way that we relate to god we relate to god more as as a loving father rather you know as as coming in in yes you need to have reverential fear to god but not in a place of of being you know always in a in a place of um, uh feeling so lowly and so guilty and dead but then god's called us to so many things greater you know for us if we if we are to be in a position of authority we need to be in a position of knowing that that we have a right standing with god if we feel we don't have a right standing with god there are many things that that we cannot do as to what god has called us to called us to do so it changes the way not just how we relate to god but also the way we relate to ourselves so we look at ourselves in the way christ looks us looks at us we look at ourselves in christ with uh, you know we look at ourselves as as being a person uh, who who has an assignment who has a purpose we see ourselves with those who have authority those who are um, who who bear the name of christ those who will go go to do great things for him those who will who is anointed by the spirit those who will go ahead to do miracles and signs and wonders and brings the supernatural to us you know so unless and until we uh, have a transformed look at ourselves we we uh, um, we we find unless we know what our identity is we will not have a good understanding of who we are and what we can do for Christ others we just live such beaten lives when we don't know who we are and when we don't um work in what god has given unto us so by being established in this by knowing who we are we not only change the way we um uh, we we see god we relate to god we change the way we see ourselves we change the way we look at others we we look at them like how god sees them and we pour out the love of god to others it changes the way that we face the situations in our lives you know um we don't go again defeated and bent down but we go in victory because we know that he causes us to triumph we know that he has called us to overcome because we are called the bond 
born of uh, we are called born of God. We are the overcomers because we are born of God. It also changes the way that we stand against the enemy. We stand up to the enemy. We stand with authority. We stand with the blood of Christ, uh, with the power and with the with the authority that He's given us in His name to cast out the works of the enemy, to cast out the powers of darkness. We know that the God who is in us is greater than He that is in the world, and we stand. Um, much stronger and much much uh, uh, greater for the purposes of God. Okay, so if if you look at our identity and and uh, you know the notes you know brings about a whole list which which I will quickly read. But then you know there is there is um, uh, in the app in the APC Bible app there is a toolkit which talks about identity and it and it brings about and and it's a beautiful um, a way to just declare who you are you know in, in taking up the verses and just declaring who you are but scripture shows you this and if if you'd like to look up the verses you can look up the app and you would find uh, all the verses that is there over here so it it calls you um, and i'm just going to read that it says you're a child of god you're a new creation you are abiding in, in him you're alive with a new life you are an heir and a joint heir with Christ. You are assured of all the promises. You're blessed with all blessings. You are delivered. You're enriched, established in God, filled with his fullness, uh, free from the law, free from rituals and traditions. You're given abundance of grace. You have eternal life. You, you, you are the wisdom of God. You, you, you are God's dwelling place. You have been identified in his depth. You're justified, you're loved by God, you're one body, you're one with Christ, you're part of an eternal purpose, you're preserved, you're raised up, redeemed, righteous, sanctified, sealed, sealed in Christ, victorious, walking in him, and you will be resurrected. So these are you know, these are affirmations. I um, often, you know, in secular counseling, there are people who read affirmations and, and, you know, it amazes me the number of people, especially with those with anxiety and depression, wanting to read affirmations. And um, these, these truths, these aren't just affirmations. These are truths that actually are bedrock to us. You know, and all we need to do is just believe and identify with this. And there is so much of it. So, you know, I, I think as believers, we should be every morning reading this, this out to ourselves. It is who we are in Christ. This is my identity. I am this. And just um, allowing it to deepen this truth, to deepen in your spirit, because from this comes um, your emotional wholeness and, and so many other things, right? I mean, this is specifically focused on emotional wholeness. And you find that the more that you uh, you just uh, keep keep believing and learning and staying in this truth, the more um, uh, uh, changes comes in your emotional self and into your emotional wholeness, okay? So knowing who we are in Christ. So take time to keep studying this, keep affirming this, to yourself, keep declaring it to your situation, to who you are and to uh, to your family, maybe members of your family, keep declaring this and you will begin to see the power of God uh, much more, uh, much, much more uh, evidentially in your lives, okay? Uh, before we go to the last point, is there any question? Or I could, uh, I could quickly um, move into the third point, any question? Okay, so we we'll, so the last part of how do how do we journey into our emotional wholeness is to release the past. Okay, um, it is to uh, let go of what has been. Now, in life situations, and all of us sitting here have probably um, have most often and probably gone through some situation in life that has been rough some situation in our past that's been uh, that's been a struggle that's caused us pain and that's caused us struggle and um, very rarely can we find someone who has has had a perfect uh, past or a perfect um, uh, years that has gone by 
okay while we see that there are many things we cannot do to go back to our past and um, undo that or we cannot just close our eyes and uh, shield ourselves to pretend that no, none of that did happen um, what we must do is to come to a place to release the past to let go of the past as we walk into what god has for us we remember that every new day has um has has something new to offer us offer offer us okay and we do not carry what has happened bef uh, before into into our todays or in or into our fu future because if we carry that we will we will be burdened by by what has happened in our <coughs> excuse me what has happened in our past and the burden is just going to get worse because you're carrying so much which you need and carry it's like this you know when you're driving a car what what happens is excuse me you cannot be looking at your rear view mirror right because if you look at the rear view mirror you're definitely going to crash uh, forward you have to um focus forward you have to be looking forward uh, into into your windshield uh, right ahead and not looking at the rear view mirror yes there may be times you may need to look <coughs> look back so that you can uh, could you kindly give me a minute and just grab a glass of water please excuse me yeah thank you yeah so uh, if you're going to look uh, yeah there are times that you may need to look in uh, to to some things of your past probably learn from it so that you don't make <clears throat> a mistake in um, you know in doing the same things but you cannot allow the past to hold you captive it, you cannot allow the past to dictate what is going to come for you in your future you need to release um, and and also come to a place of healing of all that has been carried through uh, in from the past to your present okay so when you look at your future you're looking at it through the promises of god through what god says in his word rather than the experiences of your past or the meaning or the influences that you've made from your past so looking into god into your future with what god has uh, has for you and has declared in his word for you some of the uh, good examples that we can look at is um, uh, the, the example of jacob we find that uh, when you read through genesis uh, 31 to around 32 you will see uh, you know the story of jacob goes and, and i'm sure most of us are familiar with that is how jacob cheated his brother for his birthright and uh, he stole his uh, his birthright took an opportune moment to steal his birthright at the time when um, esau was uh, was hungry and was tired he stole his birthright and you know in those days birthrights were were big things were were very important for that jewish culture you know having your birthright and as a result of this and he stole the blessing that was due unto him uh, due unto uh, esau jacob stole the blessing that was due unto esau and we see that he ran away and we see that you know uh, he took uh, shelter in uh, in uh, uh, in his uncle's place for for many years and um, as he had decided so he he went there he got married he had children and as he decided to uh, leave home we we see that uh, uh, you know uh, esau sends him a um, message saying that he wants to meet him he wants to he, he's there to meet uh, esau on the way and this definitely you know let's say it's like 20 22 years passed and uh, jacob has become extremely scared and he's very fearful and uh, uh, quite anxious about what he's going to do when he hears that Jacob, that Esau is going to come to meet him. Uh, and, and what he hears further, you would read this in Genesis 32, that he's just not coming alone, but he's coming with, with 400 men. 
right? And uh, Jacob gets extremely scared. And he's, of course, so fearful that what he does is he cries out to God. And before that, you see that that night, Jacob has, uh, has an encounter with God where he's intensely um, fighting with God. He engages with God. And what does God do? God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. And, um, uh, and, and even in that change of the name is so significant, Jacob mean, meaning that who's a deceiver to Israel, meaning uh, a person who is at, at peace with God or who's, a, who's, who's, a, who's at peace with God, who was with stature or in a relationship with, with God. So when Jacob goes to meet Esau, he goes to meet him with this new name, with this new identity that is Israel. So, you know, in the natural also, Esau would not be able to do anything uh, to, to change who Jacob was because God had uh, given him this new identity because that's what Jacob had right now. He had received it straight from God. So, you know, just learning to understand that, you know, whenever uh, we need to face, face something of our past, we don't face it uh, uh, through who we were, but we we face it with with who we are in our identity with Christ. That is who we are. We face our past because of what Jesus has done to us. We understand that all the things that has been old, everything that has been of the past has passed away. And all things from the time we received Christ is only new. From the time we received Christ is only a new creation. And we see that it is because of what God has done. So because God has instituted that for us. He made us <clears throat> a new creation <clears throat> so that we do not take back <clears throat> what is of the past into the future. Another example that we can see is that of Joseph. <clears throat> Excuse me, just a minute. Sorry. Yeah, so another example that we see is, is that of Joseph. Now, if you look at... Uh, Joseph's life, his life was um, was quite stricken with so many <clears throat> difficulties, and uh, probably Joseph, when he was um, when you know when he was uh, betrayed by his brothers, would have probably been very young, uh, as you know, a really young age, maybe in his in his teens, and uh, with with the kind of things that that had happened. Joseph, so it didn't, it didn't stop there, right? After Joseph was, was uh, uh, sold by his brothers uh, to, the, uh, to the Egyptians, they, they were, um, to the travelers, they were sold off to the Egyptians. And there he became, he was a slave, he was sold off as a slave. And then um, later you find that, you know, there, there were, uh, you know, he, he got into a place, you know, he got a breakthrough in his life and got a place where um, into, uh, into the palace where he was he was he was given the position to take care of things and there he was falsely accused by uh, by Potiphar's wife and um, and as a result you know was thrown into into prison and there he spent so many years again in prison till he you know he again found a breakthrough with all of this that Joseph went through and for us it's easy reading because one goes into another but you know the the many years that Joseph spent um in that difficulty would have definitely brought him uh, to a place of of such emotional struggle but what do you see you know in uh, when when Joseph had his sons we see that um, uh, how he declares and we see that in Genesis 41, 52 and 51 and 52. And I'll, I'll just read that. It says, Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh, for God had made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And he calls the second one Ephraim and says, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. <clears throat> and so it says, you know, where, uh, uh, where there was so much of pain, and there were so many things that went by. He says, God was the one who takes away even the memory of what had happened to him and, and his father's house. We see that, you know, <clears throat> that, that, that God had 
removed the pain and in turn had made him fruitful in the land in the land where there was affliction so where there was pain there was fruitfulness because of what joseph had done had had chosen what did he choose to do he just chose to release whatever had happened he chose to forgive even even when he has the encounter with his brothers he chooses to forgive even when he has um, if he's bought bought back into position he he forgave his brothers he you know we we see the, the, those heart wrenching stories where he where he goes and hugs his brothers and goes and meets out his father and says you know i i have nothing against against any of you but what you meant for my harm god has meant for my good he declares that so god is able to do this work in us when we release uh, us uh, when we release the pain when we release whatever has happened in the past god causes us and creates for us a joy and a peace and a blessing in those very very many areas of our past okay so god god wants uh, uh, us to be in a place of that blessing where where we are where we um, where we can release the past so what do we do how do we do that and there are four things that that i just want to highlight how do we release the past one is to give up our rights we must be willing to give up our right to give up um, uh, the need to hold on to our past against god against ourselves and against others we must give up that right to hold on to what people have done to us to those emotions and to those events that has caused us pain and when we give up that right we are we are giving it up unto god you know god is waiting to hold it and we 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 feel quite selfish and quite justified in holding it so um, we come to a place to give that right up we we give up that right to hold things and instead we we come to a place of um, releasing we come to a place of forgiving others we come to a place of forgiving ourselves and to and to just what do we do when we give up that right we placing it into god's hands and we know that only jesus can cast and removes that passed away from us we see you know his scripture is uh, says that he takes away um, our sins and he throws it into the depths of the sea or he's the one who uh, who does not remember our sin no more and, you know he's removed it as far as the east is from the west or it says that he removes our past and causes every old thing to pass away um the scripture shows us that he does not remember the sins of man he does not remember our sins and lawless deeds and he's the one who makes everything brand new he changes everything for us so what is it that we can do you know to think about whatever has happened to us and you know almost take it and place it into the hands of god and what is it that we can do we can take whether it be pain it be betrayal it be um anger it be uh, rejection it being abuse it can be uh, injustice whatever has has been there we place it into the hands of god and release it to him and not have a hold of it anymore because we know that he's the one who brings all things new the other thing that we come to a place to doing is to release forgiveness to all of those who have offended us to be able to give out um and show out that mercy to people and once we've done that we stand firm with our decision of of not yielding to the need or to the temptation of what has taken us back to our past so whenever those memories or those thoughts come back to us when 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 they tend to haunt us we stand very firm with our decision that we will not again you know going back to the first point we will not give up our right to hold on to that because we have already placed it in the hands of god and we're not going to go back to do that again okay so so when we when we come to a place of releasing the past what are we doing we giving up our right to hold on to it we place it into the hands of god we release that forgiveness towards ourselves and others and we make that very firm decision that we will not yield back to the to that same uh, temptation again and just to reiterate the last few things uh, if you look at the last part of it there are couple of scriptures that shows and you know where god uh, declares and tells us i mean it's almost like um, in in isaiah 43 18 19 he says do not he says don't do it don't do it do it do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old it's almost like 
an instruction that's given to you. You know, you know, do not cross that line. Don't even go there. Why? Because he will do a new thing. It will spring forth. Okay, and then it says you. He will make a road in the wilderness, a rivers in the darkness, uh, in, in the in the desert. And he he is the one. He's going to do that. Or Isaiah fifty one four says that you will not be put to shame. Um, and you will not forget the uh, for for you will forget the shame of your youth. So he says, don't fear, don't be ashamed, don't be disgraced, because you will not be put to shame. So he says, he he's not going to do that. He he will not remember the reproach of of, of what you have what you have done. And Isaiah sixty one says, instead of your shame, what is given unto you, there will be double honor. Instead of your confusion there will be a rejoicing that will come. Therefore, in the land, you will possess double. And what will be yours? There will be everlasting joy. So when you choose to release all of this, what do you have? God does a new thing. God will spring forth a new thing. And God will bring about double honor. God will bring, a, bring about a double possession to you. In your land, you will possess double. And what will be there? You will have freedom. There is no more going to be fear. There's no more going to be a place of, of struggle. But there's going to be a place of everlasting joy. Amen. So as we walk into that, now this is something that becomes such, you know, pillared foundational truths for us that we walk in as we go on for, forward in life. So just, um, uh, you know, taking some time to just experience this, the, the love of the Father, who you are in Christ and taking that stand of releasing our past is what we we will have as we uh, we will start we we need to start doing as we journey into into that wholeness. All right, amen. Okay, great. We have two minutes, and uh, I'd like to just either open this up for any questions or any thoughts. If not, uh, we could just uh, close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Is there anyone with, with any questions? Sorry, Anita, uh, have you added a question? You've just written why. Do you have anything additional to your question? I think Samuel has written a comment uh, earlier. Sorry, I didn't see this. <clears throat> Adding another perspective on receiving God's love, sometimes what hinders us is not being able to be like little children and instead being too much um, adult-like and looking for reasons, logical explanations, patterns, examples, which are all good but very cumbersome and tiring. When all it may take to receive God's love would be just run into the outstretched arms of the Father and completely surrender and rest in His presence. How true. Yeah, we we feel that you know we need to do A to Z things to to have that, but it's just as simple as I mean the gospel is very simple. It's just receiving. You don't have to do anything. It's just receiving by faith and uh, uh, just just taking on His grace. How true. Very well said. Uh, very well said. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, why so many are not touched by God? Why is that big number of people? are still unaware of this awesome God. OK, um, we have so many instances where people have been convicted. Yeah, um, I, I think there is also, we have a responsibility. I would see this as <clears throat> also our responsibility where we are to be talking to others about the love of God. Yes, there are many people who do not know the love of God or even who, uh, who um, uh, ignore that and we see that in scripture that they are being blinded by the ruler of this world you know their eyes are blinded they need to be opened uh, they need to have a conviction and that is why we are there you know one to to uh, intercede to stand on behalf of our land and to intercede for our land for the healing of our land for people to see the work of God and for us to step forward and speak of his love do signs and miracles so people can begin to see that God in his love wants people to be whole, 
not uh, in in every area of their of their life so this responsibility is also ours for us to take on okay all right i think we'll close uh, may i request uh, some one of one of you to pray uh, prabhaka any of the prabhakas um, would you like to close with a word of prayer <coughs> Can I pray, Pastor? Sure, sure. Please go ahead, brother. Okay. Father, we thank you, Lord. Father, we come to your presence. Father, we thank you for the teachings, O Lord. We thank you for the wholeness in our name, in our emotions, O Father. Father, we pray, O Lord Jesus, that the words that you taught us, O Father, will have a root in us, O Father. Will go deeper, O Father. That will, Lord, in turn bear fruits, O Father God Jesus. And everything that we do, Lord Father, that we do in perfect. That we do in perfect love, O oh Father God Jesus. Father, help us, O oh Father, to release the past things, O oh Father, that is tormenting, that is holding us back, pulling us back. Father, help us to release and go forward into the destiny and the purpose that you have called us, Father Lord. We thank you for all the teachings, O oh Father. Thank you for imparting us. Thank you, Jesus. We bless our teacher, O oh Father. We thank you for it, O oh Father. In your name be glorified, Father. In Jesus' name we pray and ask, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prabhaka. Thank you, everybody. God bless. And uh, we will meet next week. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Thank Pastor. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.